So what I plan to do is I'm going to talk about more of the nuts and bolts. What is genetic testing? What are genes? What is gene therapy? Going over the distinction between so-called gene addition versus gene editing. And then Colleen is going to go through more of what a patient would go through if you are a patient with primary immunodeficiency who goes through a gene therapy trial, including the steps of cell collection, cell manufacturing, cell infusion, and what are the post-gene therapy monitoring um, and risks. So I think you all know that the International Union of Immunological Societies produces a publication, this is the one from 2017, that catalogs the number of defined syndromes um, that uh, affect the immune system. And it's clear from this graph that the number of defined syndromes has just exploded and continues to increase. So now there are greater than 350 defined PIDs, and many of them, increasingly more of them actually, have genetic causes. They can be divided into these eight categories um, with the immunodeficiency syndromes, combined immun immunodeficiency, innate immunity, immune dysregulation, primarily antibody deficiency, phagocytic disorders. And those six, I would say, are the ones that are most relevant um, for the presentations around what kinds of disorders could potentially be approached by gene therapy and probably is representing most of the people who come to this conference. So why get genetic testing? There are several reasons why. One of the first reasons is for family planning. So any family uh, who finds that their child, let's say, is affected with a PID, uh, and, who, and if you want to be able to understand what kind of risk you may have for future children to be affected, then genetic testing is key. Um, and by the same token, any person who themselves has a PID who is uh, looking to have children, again, knowing what the genetic basis is of the disease will help you understand what kind of risk there is to your children. Then there are a number of ways that genetic testing can impact the treatment of that disease. So first, uh, now that we know that so many of these PIDs have a genetic basis, we're beginning to accumulate data that is specific to specific types of genetic uh, PIDs, so that there might be the possibility that you would go see a doctor and they would say, well, people with this particular genetic form of PID tend to have these problems, and they tend to survive this long, et cetera. The other thing is that you can tailor transplantation, which as you know is a common way to treat the most serious forms of PID to the genetic subtype or to the gene um, in question. So for example, severe combined immunodeficiency, which is uh, SCID and is commonly treated by transplant, um, there are some forms of SCID that respond well to transplant with full immune reconstitution without chemotherapy beforehand. But there are others where we have shown in the Primary Immune Deficiency Treatment Consortium require chemotherapy before bone marrow transplant to have the best immune outcome. And also, now that we know more and more about the genetic um, reasons why a given patient has SCID, we're learning that some forms of SCID affect not the bone marrow cells that then become the immune cells, but instead affect the thymus, the organ in which the T cells develop. And so for those forms of SCID, bone marrow transplant wouldn't even work or would work very poorly. So again, this is another situation where knowing the genetic cause allows you to um, determine what kind of transplant to give or how to do the transplant. Another reason is that targeted therapy is becoming increasingly available. So for example, there are a subset of patients with CVID, um, especially those who not only have antibody deficiency, but also have immune dysregulation, who may have this condition where one of the CTLA-4 genes is mutated, causing only half of the CTLA-4 protein to be expressed. It's, that's a condition called haploid insufficiency. And it turns out that recently people have found that those patients may have a very good response to treatment with abatacept. Abatacept is uh, a, basically an immune blocker um, that prevents those dysregulated T cells um, from being overactive. And that um, wouldn't have been known to be useful without the genetic diagnosis in the CTLA-4 gene. And then finally, um, one of the um, absolute uh, predicators on gene therapy is that you have to know the gene that's affected. So once you have genetic testing, then that may potentially open the door for gene therapy. So this is, a, I'm going to go through um, some terminology and also give you an analogy um, of uh, genetics and cooking, uh, because I love to cook. Uh, 
And, um, and I'm going to continue with this analogy throughout the talk. So the genome is the term that we use to describe all of the DNA in a person's cell. It's sort of like a massive instruction book of recipes. You know, one of my favorites is Mark Bittman, so it's sort of like Mark Bittman, How to Cook Everything, except that it has to do with how to make the cell work. And then a gene is a segment of DNA um, that encodes a particular protein. It's sort of like a page in the recipe book. So maybe the page for the hamburger gene would give you the instructions for how to make a hamburger. Then there's a region in the DNA that's before the gene, usually, a segment of DNA called the promoter that directs when that protein is made. So that's sort of like an introduction to the recipe, saying, well, you should make hamburgers generally for a Fourth of July cookout. Most people are not going to appreciate the hamburger at breakfast, or they won't appreciate it for dessert. So you could serve it for lunch, you could serve it for dinner, that kind of thing. That's what a promoter does to control when the gene is expressed, um, which cell it's expressed in. And then amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. So they're sort of like the ingredients in the recipe. So for the hamburger, it's the beef patty and the bun and the lettuce and the tomato. And then the protein, which are molecules that perform the functions of the cell, is the name for the food that you're making, like the hamburger. <laughs> I'm, I'm pleased that this is a hit. I, I <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're very welcome to take a picture of that so that you can understand the terms. Um, and now I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about DNA. So a cell, as you know, is the building blocks of all the parts of our body is made of cells. And inside the cell, there's kind of a compartment or a bag um, that is surrounded by a membrane called the nucleus. And inside the nucleus is where all the DNA, where the genome is. And then if you kind of zone in on the genome, um, the DNA is organized into chromosomes, and there are 23 pairs of chromosomes in each cell. And if you zoom in there, you'll see that it's actually a big tangle um, uh, of a double helix. And then within the double helix, you find that actually the entire strings of DNA is made up of a code of four letters. Um, these are nucleotides, A, T, C, and G. And it turns out that um, the, it's a double helix because all the information is coded on one strand, and then because A is always paired with T and C is always paired with G, you sort of end up having this backup coded copy. So the pink copy has different letters, but if you were missing the black copy for some reason, you could just like translate it back to make a backup of the original. Okay. And that becomes important because the way that DNA gets um, gives the instructions to the cell to make proteins is sort of like making a Xerox copy of the instructions. So it would be as though the huge Mark Bittman book is too big to leave your kitchen, and when you need to go to cook at the stove, you make a Xerox copy and you bring the page of that recipe with you to the stove, and then you follow that instruction. And the way that the cell does this is it takes the backup, uh, the DNA, and use it to make a molecule called messenger RNA. And that messenger RNA has basically the same sequence as the DNA, and then it leaves the nucleus, and a bunch of other molecules called transfer RNAs that are hooked to amino acids that are the building blocks of the protein will come in and be like, okay, AUG means I'm supposed to come with the top bun, and CCC means I'm supposed to come in with the lettuce, and then you string together all the things to make your hamburger, okay? Yep, you can take a picture of that one too. <laughs> all right. So what are mutations and why do they occur? So in the genome, there's about 3 billion nucleotides or letters, these ATCG letters in the human genome. And then within that, there are about 20,000 to 25,000 genes or instruction pages. And each time a cell divides, the entire genome is copied. It would be as though every time you set up another kitchen, you would have to type out the entire Mark Bittman cookbook uh, in order to bring it to the other kitchen. And mutations are mistakes that happen in the DNA because when you're copying billions and billions of nucleotides, there's bound to be some mistakes. And the examples of mistakes in the DNA or mutations include substitutions, deletions of letters, or addition of letters. And some of those don't matter, but some of them lead to dysfunction in the gene. So for example, if you got the gene for the hamburger and you have a deletion such that the code for the hamburger is gone, then that obviously is not a functional hamburger. There are some mutations called missenses, where you're not 
taking away an entire thing, but you've substituted it for something else. So what if you substituted the beef patty for chicken? Well, that's not so terrible. I mean, it's not a hamburger, but you can eat and you would get protein and stuff like that. Whereas if you have a different type of mutation that substitutes a blueberry, that's obviously not a hamburger. That's just like not okay. So that's a loss of function mutation. And then finally, the most severe kinds of mutations are one in which you have a mutation such that you cut off the recipe before it's finished. And so you have an end signal well before you even get to the beef patty. And so then that's obviously not a functional gene either. All right. Now I want to get a little bit into inheritance and about how many mutations it takes for a person to have a disease. So every gene has two copies, one in each chromosome. The exception is that girls or women have two copies of the X chromosome, so there, there are two copies, but boys or men have only one X chromosome, um, and then they have a Y chromosome that doesn't have all the same genes as the X chromosome. So boys only have one copy of the genes on the X chromosome. And whether one mutation or two mutations cause disease depends on the gene. So for example, a lot of genetic disorders are so-called autosomal recessive. And what that means is that if the patient has both copies, one copy on each chromosome in the pair that's mutated, then they're sick. Um, whereas if they inherited one copy from mom and one copy from dad, the mom and the dad typically are healthy carriers. There's another set of diseases which are either called autosomal dominant inheritance or haploinsufficient in which one mutation is enough to cause the disease. So CTLA-4, for example, is, an, is uh, one example. And so here, both the father and the patient have a mutation in the gene and could be affected um, with disease. And then the final is the X-linked diseases. So in X-linked recessive disorders, if you've got one mutation in a boy, because he has only one X chromosome, then he will have the disease. Whereas um, his sister, if she has a mutation in one copy, then she um, is a carrier. All right. So now moving on to what is gene therapy. So gene therapy is when you're transferring genetic material, including DNA and RNA, these things that we've talked about, into a cell. And there are two major types of gene therapy. One is called in vivo gene therapy, um, which is a situation in which you're taking the genetic material and you're actually injecting it into the person in some way. You're either injecting it into the bloodstream or directly into a tissue, such as in the brain or in the liver or the lung or in the spinal fluid. The other type is so-called ex vivo gene therapy, and that's a situation where you remove cells from the body, and then you genetically modify them outside of the body, which is what ex vivo means, and then you take those modified cells and you give them back. And when we're talking about gene therapy for primary immunodeficiency, we are primarily talking about ex vivo gene therapy. So how do I know if my disease can be treated with gene therapy or not? So as I mentioned in the very beginning, the gene must be defined. And more than just knowing the gene, we need to understand something about the gene. We need to know the gene that's mutated, understand how it works, and know what cells need the gene to function. Because the gene is present in all the cells, but it may not be needed um, in one cell type or another. The next thing is you have to have a delivery system for the genetic material to get into the cell. And you need to get it into the right cell. So you need to be able to get the cells out of the body if it's ex vivo, for example. And you have to design what we call a vector to be able to somehow get the genetic material inside that cell. And then finally, you need to have a clinical trial. There are um, a very few uh, gene therapies that are now licensed, some in the US, some in Europe. But for the most part, gene therapy still is currently being conducted in the context of clinical trials. So you need somebody who has a scientific interest in developing the therapy. This is often someone who's an expert in the gene and how it works. You need to have funding for preclinical studies, which is tests in cells or in animals, to show the FDA that there's some chance that this is efficacious, that it'll work, and that it's um, preliminarily safe. And then you have to have funding for the clinical trial itself. Part two of how do I know if my disease can be treated with gene therapy or not. So when it comes to PID, most of these gene therapy trials are based on introducing a normal copy of the gene into the hematopoietic stem cell, the cells that are in the bone marrow that give rise to all of the immune cells and all of the other blood cells too. 
And the best candidate diseases for gene therapy within PID are the ones where we know that allogeneic bone marrow transplant, sort of the standard cellular transplant, is shown to work to cure the disease. And we also reserve gene therapy, which is still experimental, and we still reserve transplant, too, because it's risky for those diseases that have a severe course. If you have a very manageable disease, even if it's a nuisance and whatever, um, if it is not likely to shorten your lifespan, then one wouldn't want to take on the risks, including of death, after an allogeneic transplant. And the same goes for gene therapy, because a lot of the risks are similar. Um, and then there are some risks that gene therapy doesn't have and some risks that gene therapy specifically has. So we want to balance that. So these diseases that are approached or at least considered to be approached by gene therapy when it comes to the IUIS criteria generally fall under the combined immunodeficiencies, immunodeficiency syndromes, immune dysregulation, or phagocyte disorders. I'm going to get a little bit more into how the gene is transferred into the cell, um, and then uh, soon I will turn it over to Colleen. So different viruses can be engineered to carry the gene into the cell. Um, one type of virus is adeno-associated viruses, or AAV. Um, that's the little hexagon with the little orange thing. It infects the cell, and then the genetic material remains outside of the nucleus. It doesn't incorporate into the nucleus. So that means that if the cell divides, that AAV will get diluted. So you might start out with 100% of the cells having the gene, but if, if it uh, uh, divides, then you only end up with a quarter of them. So that's why this type of therapy is usually used for cells that will not divide, and these are the kinds of therapies that we usually do as in vivo trials. It's sort of like putting in a recipe page, but it's outside the main manual. And then the second way uh, that we tend to get genetic material into the cell is using retroviruses. So retroviruses infect the cell, but then it inserts that genetic material into the nucleus. And so that's sort of like inserting a new page into the main recipe book. And that means that every time the cell divides, that it will carry that genetic material. So this is what we use in hematopoietic stem cells, because those are long-lived cells that divide, um, and we use retroviruses to get the gene in there so that every cell coming from that hematopoietic stem cell will carry the gene. So I'm sure many of you know the basic, see that's where the little box, you know, I tried to fix that this morning. Um, this is the basic process of how an allogeneic bone marrow transplant works. So if you have a patient who's sick and needs a transplant, you need to find a suitably matched healthy donor. You need to gather a source of hematopoietic stem cells, which we call it BMT, but you know, you can use bone marrow, you can use peripheral blood or umbilical cord blood. You have to prepare the patient in some way to be able to accept the transplant and then you infuse the cells of the transplant. And the possible complications have to do with the fact that these are cells coming from somebody else. So there's the chance that the patient will reject the donor cells, and there's the chance that the donor cells will cause an immunologic complication called graft-versus-host disease. What's different about gene therapy is that you are taking the cells, the hematopoietic stem cells, from the patient themselves. And then, again, you're using this um, retrovirus, a gamma retrovirus or a lentivirus, to insert the gene into the nucleus of some of those cells and then put those back as the transplant. And the advantages here is that the patient is his or her own donor, so they're matched themselves. There's no graft-versus-host disease, and you don't need to use immunosuppression afterwards to prevent um, graft-versus-host disease. Um, this last part is, again, just to kind of emphasize what kinds of diseases, that you have to have a problem that is um, intrinsic or, you know, related to the bone marrow in order for these kinds of therapies to work. So there are some patients with SCID um, who are born without T cells, and the reason why is that the genetic cause is affecting the hematopoietic stem cells themselves. So the cells leave the bone marrow, they go into this organ called the thymus, but then they fail to come out as T cells. So if you do a bone marrow transplant in that kind of patient and replace them with healthy cells, then those cells will leave the bone marrow, they'll go to the thymus, and they'll come out as T cells. And here's a list of genes that are those kinds of SCID. But there's also a set of patients who have SCID who have the lack of T cells because their thymus is either gone or it's just like super, super small and doesn't work well. So in that case, if you were to do a bone marrow transplant, you'd replace the cells in the bone marrow. They'd try to go to the thymus, but they can't go there because it's not there. And so then that person is not going to get the right outcome in terms of making T cells. And this includes DeGeorge syndrome and several other syndromes. Um, 
This is um, a couple of slides to explain to you the difference between gene addition, which is what a lot of the gene therapy trials are, versus gene editing. So most gene therapy trials, as I mentioned, use retroviruses to add genes to the DNA of the cells. The older trials used gamma retroviruses. Pretty much almost entirely now, the current trials use lentiviruses, such as the HIV virus, in which all of the HIV genes have been taken out and it's been re-engineered to express the genes that we wanted to express. And lentiviruses not only insert into the genome, they insert in a different part of the genome in each cell. So it would be sort of like if you were missing the hamburger recipe, and in some cells it ends up inserted into the pancake recipe. But it's there, okay? Um, and so it's sort of like inserting the new page, but you can't control where in the book it's going to go. Gene editing is different. There are several different gene editing technologies, zinc finger nucleases, talons, CRISPR-Cas9. And this is a technology where you design some material that will home in to a particular spot in the DNA to cut the DNA in a specific place. Um, and then that DNA sequence can be modified almost like a word processing program, cutting and pasting, deleting, substituting letters. And so it's sort of like you have the hamburger page and you go there and you insert the whole hamburger recipe and it's ending up in the right page. So that was what I wanted to explain for my part. I'm just going to highlight some of the gene therapy trials that are open and enrolling in Boston. We have a gene therapy trial for X-linked severe, severe combined immunodeficiency, one for X-linked chronic radiolimitous disease, and then a number of other diseases. And now I'm going to turn it over to Colleen. Well, I'd say she's a hard act to follow, but I do it almost on a daily basis, <laughs> so I'll do my best. Um, anyway, so I'm going to, Sangin kind of, I think, gave a really nice primer on genetics and gene therapy, so what I'm going to do is kind of talk more about the practical aspects for patients that have um, gene therapy um, treatments. And so the first one that we described was the ex vivo gene therapy, ex vivo out of the body. So in this particular type of treatment, we take the cells out of the, the stem cells, we remove them from the patient manufacture them or genetically engineer them in the laboratory, prepare the patient with chemotherapy to make space back in the body in the bone marrow area um, for the new cells to go in and engraft. Um, and that sounds like a very simplistic way of saying it. It's way more complicated than that, but truly that's about the depth of it. Um, oh, I think I went the wrong way. So we need the starting material. So as um, Dr. Pai said, for ex vivo gene therapy, we use hematopoietic stem cells. Um, and as, uh, for those of you that don't know, most of those do live in your bone marrow, which are usually in your hips. Um, and so we have to get a way to get that out. So what we do is we give you a drug called um, GCSF, or for anybody who's ever watched TV and saw Nulasta, it stimulates white cells in people who have had chemotherapy. So we give that, or we, other, we give another new drug called Polixifor. And what both of these agents do is we give them intravenously, and it makes, all, makes the stem cells come out into the circulating blood system so that we can then go and collect them via apheresis. So apheresis is a giant centrifuge that if anybody's ever donated platelets or plasma, actually they do apheresis machines to collect. We do the same kind of uh, centrifugation to collect your stem cells the um, machine will take just the, cell, the stem cells out and everything else goes back. Um, and then what we also do is we do two harvests or two collections. So one collection is that we collect the cells we're going to genetically engineer and manufacture. We also, as a safeguard for all of our patients that get ex vivo gene therapy, is we collect what we call a backup cell. And this is a, just another small collection. So one could be six million, this would be only about two million. These are, G these are um, stem cells, but we don't genetically engineer them. We just freeze them. And we do that as a safeguard um, in the event that either something happens to your gene therapy product in manufacturing or we give them back to you. We give you genetically modified cells and they don't engraft for whatever reason. We've given you chemotherapy. We don't, you're rendered now a little, you're totally incompetent, so we need to, say, to salvage you, we call it, or we need to rescue you. So those are our rescue backups. So everybody gets two collections. One manipulated, one unmanipulated. Um, and then just so you see, the other, the, we did say that we still do, and we rarely do this anymore because phoresis has gotten so sophisticated, but another way to get the starting material is to do bone marrow harvest. So we would, they would actually take it to the operating room and, and 
um, harvest them out of your, um, your iliac crest or out of your hip bones. So you have to get the gene into the cell membrane, and so this is my simplistic way of explaining it. Um, so vectors, as Dr. Pai said, are vehicles that transport the gene into the cell, and we use viruses um, for a, in um, ex vivo, we use HIV, which are the lentis or the gamma retrols, and we use that because the viruses, as you can well appreciate, are very good at infecting cells, making you sick. So we take, we harness that ability, but we we, we um, take out the infectious part that would cause the disease, but we harness the technology that drives it into the nucleus of the cell. Um, that's just my little technique. <laughs> <laughs> it kills me every time. Um, so we, we, take, we know what the gene is of the interest that we want to replace. So we have that now. We put that into the vector, said designated vector. And then what we do is we've taken the starting material, or your collected stem cells, and we go into um, cell manufacturing, and this is done in some academic centers. We have our own laboratories. We at Children's Boston Children's Dana Farber have a large one. There are now commercial labs around the country and in Europe that are doing this. And what they do, as you can see, under biobanks or I mean under bioreactors and hoods, they actually purify out all the stem cells, isolate the CD34s, or um, which are the the, uh, the hemopoietic stem cells of interest. And then they take what I talked to you about was the vector with the gene in it. It's in a solution with all these other kind of nutrients, if you will. If you think about it, it's like a large pool of all the things that make them happy. We put the stem cells in with the vector, and we leave it in there for 24 hours. And it's through osmosis. I don't know if people remember that from science class, but it takes it up into it so that the actual the vector gets right into the nucleus of the cell. And then we change that out. We incubate them. And then after 24 hours, we change it out. And we, put new fresh vector in there. So now the cells in culture have the vector in them with the gene in them. So, and then at the end of four days, we check for, um, we take a small sample in the lab and we check for the vector presence so we can run a sample and then know how much vector got taken up by those cells so that it was a successful transduction, we call it, or a manufacture. We also check for cell, uh, sterility and we check for the cell dose to know how many cells that we've actually made. Because the cells divide when they're in culture, so you start with some and then because to be a pretty robust. So while that's all going on, the patient's getting pre prepared. So as I said, we do a backup of stem cells that are stored unmanipulated. Um, the patients get admitted to the bone marrow transplant service because this is a bone marrow stem cell transplant, but it's what we would call an autologous transplant because it's the same as the transplant. We're giving you new cells, but they're your cells. Um, and so we, you know, uh, almost exclusively everybody does this in the, under the bone marrow service. Um, we do give chemo conditioning, chemotherapy conditioning, so drugs like busulfan, triosulfan. And what that does is we have to get rid of all the other cells in your bone marrow to make room so that they won't be fighting with the new cells. So the new vector-driven cells with the new gene are the ones that are going to take root. Um, I will say quickly that one of the other safety things that we do do is while the cells are being manufactured, remember I said that takes four days, and then we, the quality part of testing them takes about three weeks. We don't bring somebody in the hospital to start the chemotherapy until we are told by the manufacturer that those cells have met all our release criteria. So that's another way of our safeguarding. We don't want to render anybody in harmful by not having a product to deliver to them. Um, and so uh, I will say that the infusion of this is somewhat anticlimactic, given what it is. I always, the first time we ever did it, I'm like, it's not glowing, it's not green, it's not like, blah, blah, and it's not. It looks like a bag of blood. And so the patient, or water, yeah. The patients are inpatient, as I said. We, um, we do administer it as a one-time dose intravenously. Um, it looks just, in, it is infused just like a blood transfusion or, you know, or, or IVIG for that matter. Um, and it, the patients are monitored the same way. We give Tylenol and Benadryl before, but remembering that this, the likelihood of having some sort of an emergent an anaphylaxis reaction to it is minimal because it's your own cells coming back. So the only thing you may react to is we use a drug called DMSO, which is an agent to freeze the product down. It smells like garlic if anybody's been through a transplant. But that's the only thing, and so that's why we do the Tylenol and the Benadryl. Um, and it's given pretty fast It's because the volume is very small. It's only between 30 and 60 cc, so it's over 15 to 30 minutes. Um, and then, oh, I'm sorry, I went the wrong way. Um, and so that's ex vivo in a nutshell. And then I'm just going to talk a little bit about in vivo because you may hear gene therapy, so just to know the difference, and as 
Um, it, it, the engraftment period for the new cells to take place can take anywhere from four to six weeks. Usually faster, but we tell parents four to six weeks in the hospital. And I'll get to a little bit of monitoring at the end. So the in vivo, just so you know here, and I think we, the, the industry is moving fast, so this may come. Um, so in vivo is inpatient. So this is a non-cellular source, so we take the vector and the protein and a capsid and we inject it into the, into the tissue of interest. Usually we do it intravenously for some because it goes right to the liver and those cells don't divide and so it lives in there for a long time. But for other diseases, they'll actually inject it into your eye or into your spinal fluid. Um, but that, the, the, the starting material is just a vector and then the vector with the gene of interest that is in, um, cased in a protein capsid. And that's capable of inducing genetic in expression in a wide variety of cells and tissues. Um, and it actually integrates into chromosome 19, thus allowing for sustained genetic expression in a variety of tissues. So as uh, Dr. Pai said, this is not currently in use in PID, more in um, hemophilias, some eye diseases, but I just tell you that because you'll hear in vivo, ex vivo gene therapy now in the field. And, and I'm, as I said, it's evolving really fast, so I can't say that won't ever happen. Um, oh, and there is really no patient preparation for the in vivo because you don't have to remove the cells, you don't have to clear space. The only thing you have to do is make sure that they don't have a neutralizing antibody to the vector we're gonna use, which is an adeno-associated virus. Um, so monitoring for outcomes. So for both gene therapies, um, what we do is we do laboratory testing for um, effects in the uh, ex vivo to check for the vector presence in the cells. So we can take a, just a peripheral blood sample, a CB, you know, like a CBC, we can send that to our specialty lab and they will be able to tell us how many vector copies in which populations of cells. So we'll know if it was successful in those cells reproducing with the gene of interest. Um, we also do immune cell recovery levels. So we'll do T and B cell subsets and you know, a lot of the same lab tests that you would probably already have. We can look for protein expression in a certain um, population of cells. And then we look for cellular um, immune, immune responses as well. When um, people uh, get, uh, receive gene therapy, by and large, 99% are on a clinical trial. And with those clinical trials comes pretty um, frequent and um, significant monitoring, both for safety, efficacy. So we're seeing you very frequently, almost monthly for the first year, for labs, adverse events. Um, remembering that these are, a lot of these are first in man, so there are, you know, we think they've cleared a lot of animal and, um, and laboratory testing, but we don't know. You know, there could be something that, that happens that we would need to know about. Um, and then the other part, which I actually, in my nursing background, think is usually, as for me, and is, is equally as important and sometimes underappreciated is, there are some parental reports of things that are not, that are more subjective than clinically driven. So for a mom to tell me that their skid baby can now roll over or is pulling up to stand, when that never happened before because he was using every calorie to fight off infection, but now is starting to meet developmental milestones, somewhat subjective, but no less important. You know what I mean? So we're, we're kind of monitoring for that as well. Um, Oh, sorry, this is like intuitively goes the opposite way. So uh, that's all good, right? So what could go wrong? So, because everything has a downside, right? So the potential problems with AX vivo is um, something called inser insertional mutagenesis. So the vector, as we said, that they, we use to drive the gene into the cell, um, can, we don't really know, where, as Dr. Pai said, where it goes in the nucleus. So it can inject anywhere on the genome. And you have things on your genome called oncogenes, and they're what cause cancer or malignancies. So if it injected too close to the oncogenes, it could fix your skid, but it could cause leukemia. So that did happen in the field, and I think if, any, if you went back and read about it, that was a good 10, 15 years ago. So a lot of very intelligent people got in the lab, stopped all the gene therapy, and retooled the vectors. So the vectors we use now, the lentes that we talk about, are a little less strong at getting into the, the genome, still, still do the job, but we are more targeted into the location, so less likely and, and pretty much not causing to turn on the oncogene. So that is one risk, and that is one of the things that we check for very frequently every six months 
we can take a sample and see if there's any clonal skewing or anything going on that looks awry in your genome. So that will happen if you get gene therapy for the 15 years after you get it. After once a year, we'll do that. Um, and then the other thing is that when we were doing the manufacturing, the stem cells could maybe not take up the vector. They wouldn't transduce so for whatever reason. And that does happen and it can happen. Um, but that is also another reason that we would not give you the chemo to ablate you and, or to um, prepare you until we know we have a, a viable product. Um, and then the gene therapy product could not engraft into the patient for whatever reason. We give you a good product and it just doesn't, you're, you know, you just don't, it doesn't engraft with you. And, you know, that, that's always a, a possibility. Um, and then for the in vivo product where I said we don't use it cellular, you could inject that product and it could work initially and then over time it could just stop expressing the protein or the gene of interest. Um, and then I told, and then just quickly I was just going to highlight, which I think is, we've kind of talked about enough, but what the difference is between gene therapy and bone marrow transplant. So gene therapy, you are your own donor. You don't need to wait for a donor or seek a donor. There's no risk of rejection or graft versus host disease because they're your own cells, so there's no GVHD risk. There is chemotherapy needed for the, if so, for both. Um, and primarily gene therapy is really just experimental in that there's several products that are coming through and getting approved by the FDA, but right now we don't have um, many on the market. Um, and just so in conclusion, PIDs are increasingly characterized not just by symptoms, but by genetics. And then the genetic definition opens the door for specific targeted therapies, including gene therapy. And gene therapy for certain PIDs is approaching the clinic soon in the U.S., and that is true. They're coming fast with FDA approval. Um, but more studies are going to need to be done for the long-term follow-up and the efficacy. Thank you. Oh, you didn't get cards? Okay. <laughs> Should I go ahead with the ones I have? <laughs> yes? Okay. All right. Great. So it's great to have some questions. Um, one of these is, is gene therapy slash genetic testing beneficial for CBID patients or is it mostly just for SCID patients? So I gave the examples of SCID mainly because at this point, about 90% of patients with SCID, we can find a genetic cause. You probably know that for CBID, it's more the opposite, that it's a very small percentage of patients where we can find a genetic cause. That said, I think that the fact that we do now have more um, genetic causes for CBID uh, known means that it is still important to get checked. I think that it is most fruitful to um, request genetic testing for CVID if you have severe disease, and in particular, if you have a lot of problems outside of just needing immunoglobulin infusions. Um, the patients who have, let's say, granulomatous infiltration into their lungs or into their um, GI tract or who have autoimmune cytopenias um, or, you know, who have a dysregulation of the immune system, those are probably the ones where you have a better chance of finding a gene. Another question is, I have had genetic testing, I have CVID, my CR2 slash CD21 has a, quote, variant of uncertain significance. Is this because more research needs to happen? How can I find out more? So the, I didn't get into, on purpose, the whole thing about variants of uncertain significance. I just gave the examples where we know what's wrong. But this is a huge, huge problem. Now that we have more and more genetic testing available, it is quite common to come up with mutations where we don't know if it's changing the beef patty to a chicken or if it's actually not changing anything. Maybe the hamburger would be, would be made just fine. Um, how to deal with this? It is true that more research is needed. I would say that your best bet would be to try to ask your immunologist to get in touch with a researcher in that gene. Um, so someone who studies CD21 and its function. 
um, or someone who specializes in genetic causes of CVID. And that person might even do something where they do research in the lab individually on the mutation that is present in your CD21 gene and see if it affects the functions in cells. You know, these are beyond clinical tests, these are research tests, but I think that's the only way to try to get an answer, unless somebody else, you know, has that mutation and then they report it in the literature that this caused the disease in the person. And then the third question I'm having here is, why chromosome 19 specifically would that change depending on the vector treatment slash original genetic etiology? So actually this is something where I just want to refine a little bit what Colleen said. So she mentioned that um, AAVs, which is true, um, can integrate, and if they do, they integrate in chromosome 19. However, it's a very small minority of AAV particles that integrate, so it's like, I forget what the incidence is, but it's like one in 5,000 cells or one in a million cells or something like that. So this integration into chromosome 19 has to do with the properties of the AAV vector. Um, and, uh, and when it comes to the ex vivo gene therapies, the things where you're adding genes into the nucleus of uh, hematopoietic stem cells, um, this uh, where it inserts in any given cell is related to the vector itself. I hope that answers that question. How does one get you? So I skipped that on purpose. Um, I'm going to say that because, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a transplanter, so I mostly am gene therapist. So I mostly receive patients who've already been worked up by their immunologist and either have or don't have a genetic cause. Um, I would say that your best uh, avenue to getting genetic testing is to talk with your immunologist. Um, and uh, and if, the, if the immunologist is... Um, less uh, practiced or, you know, has less um, uh, experience with seeking genetic testing, then you might want to seek, you know, a second opinion from um, another specialist in the field who particularly is uh, savvy about uh, how to get genetic testing. It's also a big problem because not all insurance companies um, easily um, approve uh, and pay for genetic testing. Um, you know, I'm not sure whether I'm really allowed to say this, but you know, another way that some of my patients have gone around this is that um, sometimes they will enroll in a research study where uh, a, a researcher is interested in doing a wide um, genetic testing panel, and then they may identify something on a research basis, but you can't use that for clinical um, uh, purposes, you know, because what if it's just like a mistake in the lab? What if they were looking at somebody else's cells? So sometimes what happens is, depending on how the research protocol has been designed, um, it, you may have given permission for something about that result to be released to you so that your immunologist could then seek specific testing to confirm in a real clinical certified laboratory whether that mutation is true. Um, and that's one way that you could even potentially pay out of pocket just for that one test without paying the thousands and thousands of dollars for a wide panel. Yeah, I'm not going to get into that. I'm not going to get into that. Um, if gene therapy is successful, does that mean it could be a, quote, fix and no other treatments would be needed, such as weekly sub-Q? So certainly for um, SCID, for example, the goal of gene therapy is to have it be a single treatment that fixes everything. Um, you know, whether that's going to be the case for every patient um, with every gene therapy product, we still don't know. Um, and again, this, specifically this question of needing uh, immunoglobulin replacement in SCID patients, you know, the, uh, the idea is that we're trying more and more to understand how to make it so that every patient can come off of immunoglobulin replacement. And the same would go for any disorder where the goal is to fix the B cells so that they work, you know, that would be the goal. How far away uh, in number of years are we from gene therapy being a slam dunk? Well, I mean, it, it depends on your definition. I mean, right now, um, the approved gene therapy products in the U.S. are, for example, CAR T cell therapy, which you may have heard of. You know, these are engineering T cells to um, kill leukemia. Um, and it's technically a gene therapy because it does involve 
putting genetic material, the car, into the T cells. And I mean, many people would say just the fact that that whole thing works is a slam dunk. Another um, genetic therapy, gene therapy that's been approved um, is uh, for a certain type of blindness, um, an intraretinal injection of an AAV. Um, and then the second one of that type that's been approved very recently is for spinal muscular atrophy. So, I mean, I'm very impressed by the progress so far um, in that, you know, when I started in this field, um, kind of got brought into it about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I did not imagine that we would be on the verge of having more and more of these therapies be licensed by the FDA. So I, I think we're moving into that. To just the fact that we now can take these things off the shelf and potentially give them to people is pretty huge. Percent of success rate of gene therapy versus donor, meaning probably allotransplant. You know, so this is a question that the gene therapy companies would love to be able to answer. They would love to be able to say, look, buy our product because our percent of success is better, let's say, than, um, than allotransplant. How do you actually define that? That would be very difficult. We'd have to do, if we're going to treat it like comparing to antihypertensive medicines. We'd have to do a huge randomized controlled trial where we would blind people to whether they were getting an allotransplant or whether they were getting gene therapy and then like measure the outcomes and then compare them. Okay, that's like never gonna happen, right? Even studies comparing the outcome of the same type of patient going through allotransplant versus gene therapy, those are very hard studies to do. So this is not something that we can comment on right away. And you know the risks are different. So I think we're too, it's too soon to compare the success rates. Does having the stored cord blood provide a better opportunity for getting stem cells to do repairs later, perhaps for CVID or bronchiectasis? So, um, it is true that cord blood cells coming from the person um, is one of the sources of hematopoietic stem cells that could be used for gene therapy. Um, how likely you are, so, okay, so let's have a situation where there's already a gene therapy for something and, um, you know, one of your options is that, oh, well, the, the child has a stored cord blood. We could definitely use that. Whether we would decide to use that versus get fresh cells from the bone marrow or the peripheral blood, as Colleen described, um, it, you know, it's it's there's not much to say that the cord blood is better, um, and we may want to have more cells because, in general, the more cells, the better. Then, when you extend it to a situation of you have a cord blood stored, um, you didn't really know what you might use it for, and then a gene therapy comes along, I would say it's the same issue. That, you know, the bigger you are, the more cells you need. And when it comes to storage of cord blood, let's say for, to use for um, a sibling, you know, who's affected and needs a regular bone marrow transplant, oftentimes that cord blood cell dose is not enough. So I've had many situations where a sibling was born who turns out to be a match. They had stored the cord blood, and I definitely used it because the more cells, the better, but I've always pretty much had to go back and also harvest the sibling at the same time um, to be able to get enough cells to make the patient well. And I would think for gene therapy, it might also be the same. Because the longer you culture the cells, let's say to just make them grow and expand the number of cells, the less stem cell-like they become. It's like they, it's like they lose some of the properties of being long-lived, and you don't really want that. You want to keep the culture time short. You want them to stay as stem cells so that they will last for the lifetime of the person. Those are really awesome questions. <laughs>